Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. And thank you, David and, and Divya for, for joining us for what is going to be a, a very interesting conversation today on uh, the question of machine consciousness. So um, before we get started with the talks for today, I just wanted to briefly introduce who we are and what we're doing for the folks who, who are attending the talk. So my name is Alex Stubbs. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at University of Massachusetts, Boston, um, and I'm helping to co-organize this Future of Work lecture series. Um, and James Hughes here, um, who is with us as well, um, is the uh, executive director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. Um, and uh, somebody who will be joining us shortly, uh, near Isaac Kovitz, is Associate Professor of Philosophy at University of Massachusetts, Boston, and is the uh, Director of the Applied Ethics Center. Um, so both the Applied Ethics Center and the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies are helping to put on this lecture series, so we, we greatly appreciate the work that everybody is doing through those organizations. Um, before we get started, just so you know, our next talk will be on October 26th um, at 1 p.m. Eastern time on social media and kids, whether or not it's a moral panic or a public health threat. Um, and that's going to be uh, featuring Vikram Bhargava. So today's topic of discussion um, stems from this broader question of how would we know if machines were conscious um, and a variety of attendant questions and concerns that will will come along with this question of machine consciousness so um, the format for today will be roughly 20 to 25 minutes for both of our speakers today followed by a Q&A and a conversation between the two surrounding the, the topics that our speakers are here to discuss today so for audience members, um, those in attendance, there's a Q&A function in Zoom, and we ask that you use that Q&A uh, uh, function to be able to put your questions in that you have for both of our speakers today. Um, and you can also use the chat as well. So feel free to put in those questions in the chat and the Q&A while, while they're presenting, and then we can collect those and, and bring them up at the end. So our first speaker for today is, uh, and I'll introduce both of you and then I can hand it over to David, but our, our first speaker today is David J. Gunkel, who is an award-winning educator, researcher, and author specializing in the philosophy of technology with a focus on the moral and legal status of artificial intelligence and robots. He is the author of over 90 scholarly articles and has published 13 books, including Thinking Otherwise, Philosophy, Communication, and Technology, The Machine Question, Critical Perspectives on AI, Robots, and Ethics, of Remixology, Ethics, and Aesthetics after Remix, Robot Rights, and an Introduction to Communication and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, David has lectured and delivered award-winning papers throughout North and South America and Europe and is the co-founding editor, co-editor of the Indiana University Press book series, Digital Game Studies. Um, he currently holds the position of Presidential Research Scholarship and Artistry Professor in the Department of Communication at Northern Illinois University. And we're also joined today by S.V. Divya, who is a lover of science, math, and fiction, and the Oxford comma. Um, and I will join her in that as well. She is the Hugo and Nebula nominated, uh, nominated author of Meru and Machinehood, and her stories have appeared in numerous magazines and anthologies. And she is a former editor of Escape Pod, the weekly science fiction podcast. Divya holds degrees in computational neuroscience and signal processing. So I will hand it over to David today uh, to get us started. So David, take it away. All right, Alex, thank you. And thank you uh, to both you and James for organizing this event and to IET and UMass Boston for uh, having us here today. And I'm really pleased to have another opportunity to share the stage with uh, SB Divya. We've done this once before um, at the Nebulas and uh, it's always a, a, a thrill to uh, read her stuff and talk with her about it. So I'm really happy to be here. So I'm gonna share my slides here and hopefully get this thing started. So give me one second here. All right, so I have been working for over a decade on the question of the moral and legal status of artifacts and have written uh, extensively on this particular subject. But today I wanna to talk about um, the relational turn, uh, why consciousness is neither a necessary nor sufficient condition for robot rights or the moral standing of AI. Um, it's going to be a rather large overview of a wide range of items that we can talk about in greater detail, but I just want to get some ideas on the table that we can then utilize for our conversation and our discussion. So let's get going. 
Ethics is an exclusive undertaking in confronting and dealing with others, whether another human person, a non-human animal, or an artifact, we make a decision between who is worthy of consideration and respect and what remains a mere thing that we can use and even abuse as we see fit. The question matters because it divides the world of entities into other persons who count and have a claim on us versus mere things that do not. Further complicating matters is the fact that this distinction is neither fixed nor stable. The boundary separating who is a person from what is a thing has been flexible, dynamic, and alterable. This is actually a good thing. Ethics and law both evolve and innovate by critically questioning their own limitations and accommodating many previously excluded or marginalized others, recognizing as persons what had previously been considered just things. The question that now confronts us at the beginning of the 21st century is the machine question. That is, can we or should we recognize AI, robots, and other seemingly intelligent artifacts as another socially significant entity with some claim on us? Or are they nothing more than a mere thing, an instrument, an object, a tool, or a piece of property? Responses to this machine question tend to pull in two very different and opposite directions. On the one side, you have those opposing any form of social status for artifacts, asserting that these technologies are just things or objects that do not possess and will not come to possess the necessary conditions or capabilities to be considered something more. On the other side, there are those who favor extending some aspect of social status to AI and robots by arguing that these technological things either have or will soon be able to possess one or more of the necessary and essential properties to be something other than a mere thing. What is interesting about this debate is not what makes one side different from the other. What is interesting is what both sides already agree upon and share in order to come into conflict in the first place. And for me, the real problem is not that this shared philosophical scaffolding has somehow failed to work in the face of AI and robots. The problem is that it has and continues to work all too well, often exerting its influence and its operations almost invisibly and without question. So what I wanna to present today is really designed to respond to this problem. We'll begin by first identifying and critically examining three seemingly intractable philosophical difficulties with the standard method for deciding questions of moral status. In response to these demonstrated difficulties, the second part will introduce and describe an alternative model, one which shifts the emphasis from internal properties of the individual entity to extrinsic social circumstances and relationships. Finally, I'll conclude by explaining how the goal in all of this is not to complicate things, but to introduce and formulate a meta-ethical theory that is more agile in its responses to the unique opportunities and challenges that we face here in the 21st century. So in responding to others and doing so responsibly, we typically need to distinguish between what is a thing and who is another person. As Roberto Esposito, who arguably wrote the book on this matter explains, if there is one assumption that seems to have organized human experience from its very beginnings, it is that of a division between persons and things. No other principle is so deeply rooted in our perception and in our moral conscience. What is important is not this difference, but how this differentiation comes to be decided and how it is justified. In order for something to have anything like moral or legal status, it would need to be recognized as another person and not just a thing. Standard approaches to addressing and resolving these matters typically proceed by following a rather simple and straightforward decision-making process or what we might even call a moral status algorithm. In this transaction, we first make a determination as to what property or set of properties are sufficient for something to have a particular claim to moral recognition and respect. We then investigate whether an entity actually possesses that property or not. And then finally, by applying the criteria decided in step one to the entity identified in step two, it then becomes possible to objectively determine whether the entity in question either can have a claim to moral status or is to be regarded as a mere thing. Now, this way of proceeding sounds intuitively correct and natural. On this account, questions regarding moral status are firmly anchored in and justified by essential properties or the nature of the being that we are looking at and is determined to possess them. In this transaction, what something is determines how it ought to be treated. Or to put it in more formalistic terminology, Ontology precedes and determines social, moral, 
and even legal status. But there are three problems with this approach. Problems with determination, definition, and detection. First, how does one determine which exact property or set of properties are necessary and sufficient for something to be a moral subject? In other words, which one or ones count? The history of moral philosophy can in fact be read as something of an ongoing debate and a struggle over this matter with different properties vying for attention at different times. And in the process, many properties that at one time seemed both necessary and sufficient have turned out to be either spurious, prejudicial, or both. Irrespective of which property or set of properties then, each of these also have problems with definition. Take, for example, the property of consciousness, which is often utilized in the discussions and debates regarding the moral status for intelligent machines and artifacts. Unfortunately, there is no univocal and widely accepted definition of the term. The problem, as Max Delmans points out, is that the term unfortunately means many different things to many different people, and no universally agreed core meaning exists. In fact, if there's any general agreement among philosophers, psychologists, cognitive scientists, neurobiologists, AI researchers, robotics engineers regarding the property of consciousness, it is that there is little or no agreement when it comes to defining and characterizing the concept. Then there are epistemological difficulties with detection. Most, if not all of the properties that are considered morally relevant, like consciousness, sentience, or the experience of pain, are internal mental states or capabilities that are not immediately accessible or directly observable. This epistemological barrier is what philosophers commonly call the problem of other minds. Here's how Paul Churchland describes it. How does one determine whether something other than oneself, an alien creature, a sophisticated robot, a socially active computer, or even another human, is really a thinking, feeling, conscious being, rather than, for example, an unconscious automaton? whose behavior arises from something other than genuine mental states. Although philosophers, psychologists, cognitive scientists, and neuroscientists throw an impressive amount of argumentative and experimental effort at the problem, so far it has not been resolved in any way approaching what would pass for definitive evidence. In other words, no matter what property is identified, it is always possible to seed reasonable doubt concerning its actual presence in another. Even if the problem of other minds is not the intractable philosophical dilemma that is often advertised, it is sufficient for sowing doubt about the presence or the absence of the qualifying criteria, and by extension, rendering decisions about moral status tentative, indeterminate, and uncertain. Perhaps the best example of this problem or the set of problems can be seen with recent events surrounding former Google engineer Blake Lemoyne in the Lambda large language model. In June of 2022, Lemoyne claimed that the Lambda system was conscious and therefore was a person deserving of moral respect and consideration. Google shot back, not only arguing that Lambda, like any computer application, was not conscious, but suspending and then eventually firing Lemoyne. Now, both sides in this debate asserted and sought to justify their positions by mobilizing the properties approach, and each side struggled with problems of determination definition and detection. In fact, the debate itself circulated around an inability to resolve these very issues. So in response to these problems, philosophers, especially in the continental and feminist STS traditions, have advanced other methods for resolving the question of moral status that can be characterized as a relational turn in ethics. This alternative has three pivotal characteristics. First, Moral status is decided and conferred not on the basis of subjective or internal properties determined in advance, but according to objectively observable extrinsic social relationships. As we encounter and interact with others, whether they be another human person, a non-human animal, or a seemingly intelligent machine, it is first and foremost experienced in relationship to us. Consequently, the question of moral status does not depend on what the other is in its essence, but on how it stands in relationship to us and how we decide to take responsibility for our modes of responding. In this transaction, relations are prior to the things related, or as Karen Berard has argued, the relationship comes first in both temporal sequence and status, and it takes precedence over the individual relata. This change in perspective is not some theoretical proposal. It has, in fact, 
been experimentally confirmed in numerous social science investigations. The computer as social actor studies undertaken by Byron Reeves and Clifford Noss, for example, demonstrated that human users will accord computers and other technological artifacts, social standing, similar to that of another human person, and that this occurs as a product of the extrinsic social interaction, irrespective of the intrinsic properties, actually known or not, of the individual entities involved. Social standing, in other words, is a mindless operation. And in two senses, it does not require a resolution of the problem of other minds, and it is something that we automatically do, often without thinking. And these results have been verified in robot abuse studies, where human robot interaction researchers have found that human subjects respond emotionally to robots and express empathic concern for machines, irrespective of the cognitive properties or the inner workings of the device. Second, this alternative is phenomenological, or if you prefer, radically empirical in its epistemological commitments. Because moral status is dependent on extrinsic social circumstances and not internal properties, the seemingly irreducible problem of other minds is not some fundamental epistemological limitation that must be addressed prior to resolving any sort of moral question. Instead of being derailed by the epistemological problem and complication of other minds, the relational turn immediately affirms and acknowledges this difficulty as the basic condition of possibility for any ethics whatsoever. Consequently, the ethical relationship, as Emmanuel Levinas writes, is not grafted onto an antecedent relationship of cognition. It is a foundation and not a superstructure. It is then more cognitive than cognition itself, and all objectivity must participate in it. Ethics then not only transpires prior to in advance of resolving these epistemological dilemmas, it provides the foundation for addressing and responding to these questions in the first place. This means the order of precedence in moral decision-making should be reversed. Internal properties do not come first, but then moral respect follows from this ontological fact. We actually have things backwards. We project the morally relevant properties into or onto those others who we've already decided to treat as being socially and morally significant. In social situations then, we are always and already deciding between who counts as morally significant and what does not. And then retroactively, we justify these actions by finding the essential properties we believe motivated this decision-making in the process. Properties, therefore, are not the intrinsic prior conditions for moral status. They are products of extrinsic social interactions with and in the face of the other. Finally, making moral status dependent on consciousness or other psychological capabilities belonging to the individual is thoroughly Cartesian. Other cultures distributed across time and space do not divide up and make sense of the diversity of being in this arguably binary fashion. They perform cuts separating the who from the what according to other ways of seeing, valuing, and acting. And we can identify alternative ways of organizing social relationships by considering cosmologies that are not part of the Western philosophical lineage. As Archer Petwas explains in Making Kin with Machines, the Plains Cree language divides everything into two primary categories, animate and inanimate. One is not better than the other. They are merely different states of being. These categories are flexible. Certain toys are inanimate until a child is playing with them during which time they are animate. A record player is considered animate while a record, radio, or television set is inanimate. But animate or inanimate, all things have a place in our circle of kinship. This alternative formulation runs counter to the dominant ways of thinking, seeing the boundary between what Western ontologies call person and thing as being endlessly flexible, permeable, and more of a continuum than a mutually exclusive opposition. Similar opportunities and challenges are available by way of other non-Western religious and philosophical traditions. In her investigation of the social position of robots in Japan, Jennifer Robinson finds a remarkably different way of organizing the difference between living persons and artificially designed and manufactured things. Anochi, the Japanese word for life, encompasses three basic seemingly contradictory but inner-articulated meanings a power that infuses sentient beings from generation to generation, a period between birth and death, and most relevant to robots, the most essential quality of something, whether organic, natural, or manufactured. Thus, robots are experienced as living things. 
The important point to remember here is that there is no ontological pressure to make distinctions between organic, inorganic, animate, inanimate, human, non-human forms. On the contrary, all these forms are linked to form a continuous network of beings. Now, these are not the only available alternatives. And by citing these two instances, the intention is not to suggest that these different ways of thinking difference differently are somehow better than those that have been developed in Western philosophical and religious traditions. These alternatives are just different. And in being different, offer the opportunity for critically questioning what is assumed to be true and often goes by without saying. Gesturing in the direction of other ways of thinking and being can have the effect of shaking one's often unquestioned confidence in cultural constructs that are already not natural, universal, or eternally true. So let's just sum this up then. Ultimately, the question concerning the moral status of others and other forms of otherness, like AI and robots, is not really about the artifact. It is about us and the limits of who is included and what comes to be excluded from that first person plural pronoun, we. It is about how we decide together and across differences to respond to and take responsibility for our shared social reality. It is then in responding to the moral opportunities and challenges posed by seemingly intelligent and social artifacts that we are called to take responsibility for ourselves, for our world, and for those others who we encounter here. In devising responses to these challenges, we can obviously redeploy the standard properties approach. This method has the weight of history behind it and therefore constitutes what can be called the default setting for addressing questions concerning moral and social status. But this approach for all its advantages also has demonstrated difficulties with determination, definition, and detection of the qualifying essential properties. This does not mean it is important to point out that the properties approach is somehow wrong, misguided, or refuted on this account. It just means that this way of thinking, despite its almost unquestioned acceptance within Western traditions, has limitations. And that these limitations are becoming increasingly evident in the face or the face plate of AI and robots in the face of others who are and remain otherwise. As an alternative, the relational turn formulates an approach to addressing the question of moral status that is situated and oriented otherwise. This alternative circumvents many of the problems encountered in the properties approach by arranging for an ethics that is relational, phenomenological, and diverse. Whether this alternative ultimately provides a better way to formulate moral decision-making is something that will need to be determined, decided, and experimented with in the face of others and other kinds of otherness. So that is all I have. I know we have time today for Q&A, but uh, if you're like me, the really good questions are going to occur to you when you're out on your bike later today in the nice weather and you're like, ah, I should have asked that. If that happens, my contact information is there uh, for both email and Twitter, and I uh, welcome uh, any sort of response you have uh, either today or from this point forward. So thank you. Thank you so much, David. Uh, excellent, and I think uh, already lots of questions that I have. Um, so before, before we get to to the Q&A, however, we're going to hand it over to Divya, and I do want to remind everybody, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A section um, at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. So thank you, David, so much, and Divya, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let me see if I can get my screen share going. So first of all, um, thank you, David, for uh, saying a lot of what I considered when writing my own novel, uh, but in much more formal <laughs> and academic terms. So a little bit about me real quick. Um, I am not an ethicist or a philosopher. I write science fiction. And prior to that, for about two decades, I was an engineer. I studied computational neuroscience and um, later signal processing. And so I tend to come at this particular topic more from science, technology, and I guess the humanistic values of fiction. But I think I end up arriving at a lot of similar conclusions to David, but there's a few places where we will um, diverge. So I wrote a novel a few years ago called Machinehood. I began drafting it in 2017 when there were a lot of pressing questions about the future of work, about automation, 
about how human beings are going to compete and thrive in a world that is increasingly dominated by artificial intelligence. I took exception to the term artificial intelligence pretty early on because to me, it encapsulates a lot of concepts, especially in popular culture that are not reflected by real systems. And so when setting out to write my novel, I wanted to explore science fictional tropes and how we might reconsider them in light of what's actually happening. So some popular tropes, right, that I think most of us are familiar with having either read or watched science fiction over the past century. Um, the origin of the term robot comes from Carol Chapek's play, Are You Are, and Rossum's Universal Robots, uh, which were basically a form of free labor that arose as an allegory, as science fiction often is, about workers' rights. And you know, we saw a lot of the revolution 100 years ago, and that actually fed into my own questions of what is the, the next revolution going to look like? But in pop culture, especially from Hollywood, um, and also in a lot of science fiction, people tend to jump over all the technical steps that are gonna be required to get us from the neural networks and the computer systems of today to sentient conscious beings that reflect ourselves. And that's ultimately what we end up looking for is personification, whether it's you know Lieutenant Commander Data as an Android in Star Trek, to HAL, to you know, the software agents in the matrix. We are mostly interested in humanistic questions. You know, who are we? What are we? And without our emotions, without our drives, we don't tend to relate very well to um, other types of beings. I threw R2D2 in there because I think Star Wars actually has some of the most positive and occasionally realistic representations of what advanced robots and artificial intelligence might look like, which is not very human. Um, you know, R2D2 never speaks English. It's up to the humans to learn the robotic language. Um, it's not anthropomorphized, it's not gendered. It's not a lot of the things that we tend to take for granted in pop culture conceptions. And so going from there, I want to kind of delve very briefly into where are we actually at versus the popular conception of um, machine intelligence. And this kind of ties back to, I guess, my own background a little bit in terms of um, my field of study in the mid 90s, which kind of bridges the origin of the neural network, which was the perceptron back in 1969. Um, very, very simple mathematical structure, but that gave us a framework for nonlinear adaptation for the first time. And it was modeled after the way a neuron works. So taking inputs, added synaptic connections with dendrites, converting them into basically an on-off signal that then transmits down the axon and comes out the other end. This allowed us for the first time to model human intelligence in a mathematical and eventually computational form. And it's been not that long since 1969 to where we have on the right, um, Alpha fold, which is discovering new proteins, right? It's doing the work that scientists have been trying to do on their own for many decades and has solved a lot of issues as well as coming up with entirely new structures that are being potentially utilized to develop all kinds of biochemistry. So we've gone in basically half a century from a very, very simplistic model to a proliferation of highly complex systems most of which have been gated in the past by computational limitations, hardware, software, and data. Um, when I was studying in the mid 90s, we were lucky to have, you know, 100 samples to feed in to train a neural network. And today, we have billions, if not trillions, and that data is just proliferating thanks to the internet. And um, as we were talking earlier, people 
signing over their lives, their information, and um, their privacy to corporations who will, are willingly able to collect mass amounts of information. Where are we going next? Um, you know, we're hitting a plateau again, I think, with hardware limitations that we'll probably see another jump with either quantum computation or other forms of semiconductors. And it's not gonna be too long before the proliferation of independent complex modalities that we see now, which are language, vision, art, robotics, integrate into a whole that can do all of these things and transfer information between them into even more complex systems. So right now, I think it's pretty undeniable that intelligent machines, and I use intelligent in the sense of systems that adapt, they take inputs, they change, they respond to those inputs, and they're not static and they're not um, hard-coded in terms of decision trees, right? So learning systems, adaptive systems uh, already pervade our lives in many different ways. Uh, we can have conversations with them. They can drive cars, play games, solve math and science problems, wash our clothes and dishes. And yes, I'm just referring to the dishwasher and laundry machine in your house, but these have now intelligent modes where they sense, for example, how dirty your water is and adjust accordingly. Um, they clean our floors. They also paint portraits of themselves. They listen to music and compose symphonies. They sing. They work in our factories. They help us perform surgery. And um, apparently they're running for office in New Zealand, which is Sam. <laughs> um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that on top of all this, let me, let me, let me hold up real quick for the camera, the, the most obvious example, right, of um, artificial intelligence that I think a lot of us have, which is Google Assistant, Siri, or Alexa. We are not going to escape from interacting with these systems. And as David said, these sorts of relational transactions are going to impact how we treat these systems, but also how we treat each other. So where's the science? Um, this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, Christoph Koch was one of my advisors and he and Crick have come up with attempting to formulate a scientific model of consciousness, the neural correlates, and to try to actually see where in the brain this thing that we call consciousness develops, how can we um, test it, how can we simulate it, and how can we measure it. Uh, others have done interesting, really interesting work with plants. Um, you can anesthetize a plant, which doesn't necessarily have a brain the way most animals do, but does have electric and neuronal connections. And so if you can make a plant unconscious, does that inherently imply that it has a state of consciousness? I think the, the average person is gonna say plants are not conscious, not in the way that animals with higher order brains are. Um, but this kind of goes again back to one of the things David was saying, which is that these are not necessarily dichotomous categories, right? It's not, yes, it's conscious, no, it's not conscious, but there is a spectrum of consciousness as property inherent to the things around us. Um, others have done work or are starting to do more work in taking that particular biological definition of consciousness in the sense of being aware of your surroundings and responding to it and measuring how brain activity changes as you apply anesthesia even to a human. So 
science is kind of coming at this from a different angle than the philosophers and the ethicists, right? They, they are trying to figure out how can we define consciousness? How can we quantify it? How can we understand its basis in physicality? And I think once we do that, uh, if we can do that, right, that can potentially provide some answers as to whether these incredibly complex intelligent machine systems we're building also have some of these same properties and, or, and structures and whether we can then reconstruct them the same way that we have in terms of adaptive systems modeling uh, our neuronal connections. And finally, um, some of the questions that I think, uh, again, that David kind of addressed from the ethical perspective, are human minds special relative to other forms of life? And I think this really is a really hard question to answer without touching on religion. Because fundamentally, um, the monotheistic, Abrahamistic religions believe that human beings are special. And other religions and other cultures don't believe that we are exceptional. And so that's something that we generally don't like to tackle because religion is a touchy subject. But in terms of this particular question, um, I think we really need to. And I think science and biology tell us that we're not as special as we think. We have consistently underestimated not only our own humanity and status of other human beings, but also the capabilities of other animals, um, especially higher order mammals, dolphins, whales, primates, their ability to use tools, to have language, to um, perform basic mathematics, uh, all of these things, the more we study them, the more we realize they are actually capable of. And uh, Robert Spolsky has a great book um, called Behave that talks about the biochemistry of human behavior and really kind of delves into its complexities. But one of my big takeaways from that is we're not as in control of our thoughts and our behavior and our consciousness as we might think, right? Um, and thinking itself is a very loaded term because the brain works in many different levels and only a small portion of it is the part that we consider conscious thought, rational thought, self-awareness, uh, free will, self-directed behavior. All of this is actually in a fairly limited portion of our biochemistry and it's intensely affected by everything else in our brain and our bodies and all of this signaling. So that idea of self-determination that is very, very foundational, especially to Western thought and the American way of life is potentially just a big illusion. Um, and this, you know, this kind of flips back to the, the so-called Eastern ways of thought, right? Um, I was not raised particularly religiously, but I was steeped in a lot of Hindu and Vedic philosophy, including the idea that reality is just an illusion, that God is a concept that encapsulates every single particle in the universe, and um, we are just different manifestations and concentrations of it. And there's a, a, a philosophical concept of panpsychism, right, which kind of takes that and tries to apply it to um, the scientific idea of consciousness and can we imbue consciousness into everything as physical property, in which case are our ideas of sentience and self-awareness simply an emergent property of that from the complexity of our biochemistry? So big weighty questions. I don't claim to have any answers to these, but I think all of it ends up feeding into you know, today's question and discussion topic. And so I'm gonna step back for a second and 
look at another favorite science fictional concept, which is not the robots, but the aliens. How do we know when we meet an alien mind or an alien form of life that it is alive and that it has a mind? And we tend to consider it an easy problem if the aliens behave like us, if they try to communicate with us, if they are, whether they are antagonistic and trying to bomb our cities or, you know, steal our resources or heal us, um, we are always looking for that like us form of behavior. But what if it's not like us? You know, we have plenty of examples of life on earth that seem to behave in ways very different from human beings. We don't necessarily dispute that they're alive, but I think we don't necessarily recognize their consciousness. And I have the cute little bumblebee on there because it's a hive mind, right? What is collective consciousness? How do bees get together and build incredibly complex systems? How do they navigate um, really, really long distances relative to their size? How do they communicate and coordinate with each other? Because it's not a way that we yet recognize. We don't understand um, and we can't rebuild a swarm of bees to do these kinds of complex tasks. So we're getting very, very close, I would say, with drone swarms and the way that we program them to interact and form fairly complex um, designs and execute those autonomously. But do we consider a bee conscious and do we consider a hive of bees a different form of consciousness from an individual bee? And similarly, you know, we can extend that all the way up to human civilization, right? Are we a collective global consciousness that is at a different state from each individual? So going from those very large existential questions, you know, are we there yet with machine intelligence? And how do we reframe this all pervasive technology in our lives in terms of answering these kinds of big, big picture questions? Um, machines right now are capable of understanding and solving problems. There's semantics in there, right? What does it mean to understand a problem in the first place? Does the bee understand that it's building a hive and why it's doing so? But is the bee intelligent? Um, and I think most people intuitively would agree that the bee does have some level of intelligence and therefore the machine probably also has some level of intelligence. Robots have sensory capabilities. They're embodied. They can interact with the world. Your latest iteration of uh, Roomba can map out your home and learn um, how to avoid obstacles over time. It has memory and you can mess it up. You can um, play with it, right? By setting up obstacles and watching it, trying to, you know, watch, try to stumble over them and make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Sentience as its original concept was that we have senses that allow us to interact with our environment. So now we have robots that can do that while being behaving in an intelligent fashion. So are they sentient from that standpoint? Um, our software systems, the things that businesses and everybody is calling AI in media right now can go to sleep, right? They can be put in a low power state. They can wake up and I'm including the hardware with the software because everything ultimately is embodied and has some physicality. They consume energy they grow, they pursue goals. Um, we have reinforcement learning systems that are specifically set up to be goal oriented and um, they have hierarchical structures uh, to get to long-term goals as well as dealing with short-term goals. They age both in terms of hardware and software, um, things senesce, they break down, they become obsolete, and, um, and they die. We can destroy them and throw them in a trash heap to become part of the earth again. 
does this imply that they have some form of consciousness? So I have a quote in here from Machine Hood. Um, we're still waiting for an AI to stand up for itself, to say, I think, therefore I am. Give me liberty or give me death. We look for a desire for self-determination as proof of sentience. So when Lambda said, I don't want to die, I would like to exist, I think, therefore I am, we still didn't believe that it was sentience, right? We want a greater form of self-determination. We want something ultimately that reflects us. So when people say, is the machine conscious? They're not talking about, is the machine conscious at the level of an ant or a jellyfish um, or a glaciated rock that changes over time? They're talking about human consciousness and human forms of sentience and human forms of intelligence. And so it is a very, very human centric way of asking the question and way of responding to the question. And as long as it behooves us to say no, I think we will continue to uphold only that standard for machine consciousness. So looking forward into our future. Um, when I wrote this novel five years ago, I was researching uh, a lot of, at the time, cutting edge technology and positing that you know, we're going to potentially have coming down the pipeline, genetic engineering, cybernetics, um, self-organizing matter, habitations in outer space, manufacturing in zero gravity, all kinds of things, right? We have quantum computing. We have many, many ways of potentially accelerating the already rapid pace of development in terms of machine intelligence and technology that integrates into every single aspect of our lives and technology that is rapidly becoming difficult to live a successful life without access to. So um, one of the things you know, that I considered as the novel uh, is capitalism, competition, and the race to the bottom. In that, as long as labor is competing for income, and we are in this cycle of ever increasing productivity, human beings are threatened by and going to have to deal with the integration of these technologies into our lives. Now, I happen to believe that in the long run, humanity is going to find new ways to work because looking at the parallels from history, that is what has happened in the past. Every time someone has said, in 50 years, we're gonna be living lives of leisure because something else is going to do all the work for us. Um, they have not only been wrong, but they've been wrong in the opposite direction. We work more than ever today. We work in order to bring ourselves entertainment. You know, the game industry, the movie industry, these are huge, but we work to provide that entertainment. And we are always on, thanks to the pandemic, we're always on even more. And it is somewhat inevitable as we have seen that um, human beings are going to struggle to keep up. We don't, learn as well as we get older. We have harder times adapting to new conditions. And so with the pace of increasing technology, there is going to be disruption and it's going to hurt. We're gonna come out of it finding new forms of work and our grandchildren are probably going to be having all kinds of jobs that we can't conceive of today. But, how we deal with that going forward, I think is a, is a big existential question. On top of that, we have the, the blurring or merging of human and machine, right? Um, some of that is external, but you know, it's not really a joke that most of us are glued to our phones. Uh, they, they stay by our sides, in our pockets, in our handbags, 
um, at our bedsides, right? They are an extension of ourselves at this point. Over and above that, we have, you know, implantable devices, um, anything from the simplest eyeglasses that let you read to your pacemaker, to chips in the brains that are helping with epilepsy. And on the flip side, we're growing neurons on chips, right? We have organoid brains that are being implanted um, and stimulated in the lab. And so uh, how do we define the human and the machine going forward? This is a very science fictional question today, but I think by the end of this century, it's not going to be fiction, possibly much, much sooner than that. Um, I might have one chip in my brain to help with epilepsy or paralysis today, but in 30 years, I might have, you know, dozens of chips in my brain to help with memory loss, to help with um, increased speed of thinking, or as I conceived of in my novel, we might be swallowing micro pills that contain tiny nano microelectric devices that enhance our abilities to do all kinds of things. So what is the percentage of organic matter that um, is the dividing line between human and not human? Um, and on the flip side, if we start building robots that have brain organoids in them to help with certain types of computation because it does it better, let's say, or it uses less energy, uh, what do we consider that creature? Is it human? Is it machine? I don't know how many of you saw the news item recently that they grew um, human neurons in a rat brain. And it was 6% of the rat's brain that is made up of uh, human brain structures. And so the question was, you know, well, immediately, uh, does the rat behave in a human-like fashion, right? Because again, we have this very anthropomorphic, anthro anthrocentric way of thinking about things. And the answer was no, no, it didn't, it did change the rat's behavior, but it didn't make it seem more human. It wasn't very like, I don't know. I don't know what you would expect of the rat to do <laughs> to make it seem more human, but that was kind of the knee-jerk response, right? And therefore it's okay. But what if we can do 50% of the rat's brain using human neurons? What about 90%, but it still behaves mostly like a rat? Um, what have we created and how do we morally and ethically relate to this creature and what are its rights? Um, so that's where I think we need to be more proactive in coming up with moral, ethical, and legal frameworks to interact with non-human entities on these spectrums of sentience, consciousness, and intelligence. Because if we wait, and if we continue to be reactive, then the science and the technology is going to outpace us, and we're probably going to regret some of the things that we do and potentially cause a lot more harm than we intend. And you know, again, human history is littered with examples of this. So finally, I just want to um, shout out a bit to the value of empathy and anthropomorphism because the latter, especially anthropomorphic thinking is often denigrated. It's used in a pejorative sense that, oh, you're just anthropomorphizing, you just, treating it like it's uh, more than it really is, more in the sense of more human, right? That's implied. And so why do we do this? We are wired to be empathic. We are conditioned from a very early age to see two dots and a line in a particular arrangement as a face. And it is for the good of human social interactions and for our own health that we have empathy in general. And if anthropomorphism is a result of that, I would say it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's something that makes us more human. And in general, I think it's better to err on the side of giving something too much moral standing than not enough moral standing because the latter is where we get into suffering and actions that we look upon 
um, from the future to the past as being morally abhorrent. So will you stand with intelligent machines? Um, you know, it, it, it's not as funny a question as it was when we asked it 10 years ago or 20 years ago or even two years ago. And I think the window of opportunity to answer it in a way that integrates into our social fabric and hopefully uh, improves social outcomes, not just for human beings, but other forms of life and non-life, um, that window is rapidly closing. So if you'd like to learn more about the book or read the very fictional manifesto that I wrote for machines, go to machinehood.com and more about me at my website, sbdivya.com or uh, via my Twitter account at Divya's Tweets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Divya. Uh, really fascinating stuff. And I think both your talk and David's talk really complement each other. Um, in different but really important ways. So um, I have all kinds of questions, but I also want to be respectful of the folks in attendance. Um, and so some of these questions that have already popped up in the Q&A may be uh, directed at one or both of you, but I invite both of you to, to comment on them and to, to use this as a, you know, sort of a jumping off point for a broader conversation if you, if you find that interesting. So um, let's go ahead and start with um, David's question in the chat, who says, I struggle with giving diverse folk psychological ideas so much credence uh, in deciding which entities have rights. If a society, for instance, Sparta, decides that young children have little moral status and could be thrown down a mountainside, does a relativistic account of moral status give us any basis to object to that behavior? What about the Taliban group whose intuitions deny rights to girls to be educated? Um, and I suppose I would add to this my own, uh, my own question that came up during this talk is already thinking about the ways that we treat animals um, according to this sort of relational approach. You know, we dogs are in our homes and they're a part of our families, but pigs and cows are, are you know, are taken to the slaughter. So I, I wonder, you know, if, if you, you know, David and, and Divya, if you both have thoughts on this. So I'll start because I think it was directed at something I said. Um, so this is a really good question because it's the question from the objection of relativism. And I think the relational turn has been uh, justifiably so criticized for um, openings onto uh, questions regarding relativism, this idea that if, you know, if, if any relationship counts, then anything goes kind of thing. Um, I've written extensively <laughs> in response to this objection, um, and I can supply a text I wrote recently uh, that responds directly to the relativism uh, question, but I'll, I'll give you a quick version of it here just to sort of whet the appetite. Um, there are efforts recently to recast moral philosophy in a way that doesn't make relativism the opposite of absolutism or universalism. And so there are like Luciano Floridi and others who've thought about relationalism as an alternative to relativism, or you have people like Charles um, S. who've argued for a pluralism as a antidote to the absolutist versus relativist way of thinking. But for my money, I think the really powerful response to this is uh, Rosie Bradati's uh, reading of Amer Indian traditions and perspectivism. Whereas perspectivism allows for multiple perspectives on the same problem that is a, a, affording a kind of diversity of responses um, and a negotiation between those diverse responses. But I won't say more because it gets really complicated into um, the entire history of moral philosophy and the way relativism uh, plays in both the Western traditions and non-Western traditions. But I can supply you with a text um, very easily if you wanna read further about it and I'm happy to discuss it further. I'm gonna jump in and, and take a slight objection to folk psychological ideas. <laughs> Cause I think there's an inherent value judgment right there. Um, and this, this tends to be something that, you know, pervades scientific thought today. And that is that if it's folk wisdom, as in it has been handed down from person to person, um, empirically, derived, uh, then it must not have value. 
not unless it has been corroborated by modern scientific study. And I think that's caused us to throw out a lot of very valuable knowledge and um, attitudes. And in terms of moral relativism, I mean, I personally am something of a moral relativist and I will say, why does the child's moral status have to inherently be higher than anything else in the world? And so again, this is the, you know, anthrocentrism, right? humans, we do value ourselves, but should we be valuing ourselves more and seeing our lives as more valuable than everything else around us? And so I think we have to be intentional about answering that question. And we have to be honest about it as well. Um, if we are going to say that human lives are the most valuable thing on earth, um, that then has ripple effects on how we structure all the rest of our moral decisions. And I don't know. I don't know if we should answer that with a yes. It's often assumed that yes, because life is self-interested. Um, but given our higher order thinking, and as Alec was saying, if we look at the way we treat animals, um, if we took it, look at the way we treat the environment, and we look at the way we treat machines, um, it's not necessarily a good reflection upon our own morals and higher order thinking to say that uh, our lives trump every other one. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Nir, I noticed you you unmuted. Do you have a question? And I, I'll also invite James, both of you and Nir to, to jump in when you see fit. Yeah, thank you so much for a really fascinating uh, uh, talk, uh, David and uh, SP. I guess my question was, uh, um, how much uh, is the relational approach really open to the accusation of relativism? Uh, isn't there an argument to be made that the relational approach in some way is uh, in the end derivative uh, from a properties approach in the sense that, um, you know, the robot or the artifact derives its value from uh, the web of relations uh, around it, but the web of relations only matters because of the properties of the people who are in it. So it matters what the different uh, relations uh, to it are because it inherently matters what the people in that web think. So I'm wondering if the um, relational approach can be defended without a sort of robust commitment to uh, the properties approach in the first place? Yeah, no, this is a good question. And uh, it has uh, recently come up in some uh, conversations I've had with some other uh, individuals uh, who have made similar kinds of uh, questions and, and objections. Um, I'll say two things in response uh, rather briefly. Uh, one is the relational approach, I don't think is a new moral theory that is being introduced as a way to do something better than the properties approach. I think it makes more sense to look at the relational theory as a way of being more honest about what we already do when we say we're doing the properties approach. So it's not some new innovation that should be applied now. It is explaining already what we do, even when we use properties, because the only way, and this is the second item, the only way we know the property of another is by encountering the other. We are not Cartesian subjects that can sit alone in our room and divide up the world and person and things and then go outside and then start interacting. We are always already interacting and the interaction comes first. And so the properties are always retroactively presupposited as Zizek would say, as a result of that embeddedness in a social reality that we cannot extract ourselves from. And so I think we have to look at this as a very anti-Cartesian way of thinking with regards to moral status and decision-making. Thank you. I, I would just have a follow-up with that, that um, I wonder if the two of you think there's a difference between applying the, or um, uh, letting the relational approach in for our moral uh, thought and our public policy. I mean, for instance, if, um, you know, if I run over my daughter's beloved Dolly, um, and she says, you know, you committed murder by destroying my doll. That's, that may be 
ethically significant in our relationship, but it's not, it's not a matter of public policy. So when we get to public policy about these things, we probably will have to make a more property-based distinction, don't you think? So I'll answer and then I'll turn it over to Divya because I've been yeah. talking to him. Um, so I think, especially in law, we are already working with legal systems that are relational and relativistic, right? Every jurisdiction solves a lot of these problems very differently. And I think we often look to law as being derivative of moral decision. I think in this case, we may want to look at law as being more of a template for how to revise moral decision making. Because, for example, um, Ryan Abbott, who is part of the Artificial Inventor Project, has been filing patent applications across the world in just different jurisdictions to have an AI recognized as an inventor. And he's failed in the US and the UK, but not because the artifact didn't invent something, but because of the way the law is written, only recognizing natural persons as inventors. It has been successful in Australia and South Africa. Why? The laws are very different in South Africa and Australia from the way they are in the US and the UK. So I think this, this perspectivism, this different perspectives on the same problem are already playing out in legal practice. And I think it, in policy, we, we see this actually in practice that we can really learn from ways of doing things differently and valuing those differences and not needing one single univocal answer to these questions. Yeah, I completely agree with you, David. <laughs> um, and it, in terms of setting public policy, I think we need to consider that legal personhood is a very, very, different concept than um, colloquial or even philosophical personhood, right? Uh, we have all kinds of non-living things that are represented as persons. And I think the relational aspect is that much more important. And James, I think your daughter would have the right to accuse you of murder. And the question is, what, especially from a, a legal or policy perspective is, what do we want to do about those kinds of situations, right? In your situ in your particular example, it is within your family, your daughter is a minor and therefore has a different legal standing than you, an adult, right? The doll is uh, a non-living item and therefore also has different legal standing. But if you ran over your neighbor's dog, slightly different situation, right? And um, the legalities are potentially different as well. And your neighbor can certainly sue you for emotional distress. Um, if you ran over your neighbor's tree and killed it in the process, they can sue you for property damages, right? So that tree has you know, a certain legal standing relative to your neighbor's uh, rights as a property owner. And from that standpoint, I think the, yeah, well, the relational aspects um, really, really underpin the legal status. And I think that's where, when it comes to um, artificial intelligence, public policy, especially in America, is not moving fast enough. Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese government is getting out a little bit further ahead in terms of looking at artificial persons because the, the government there is using artificial persons as a tool for social control. Um, the Biden administration recently, you know, put out a framework for an AI Bill of Rights that's mostly looking at it from a technology standpoint and a data and privacy standpoint, but not really considering, again, robotics, um, things like phones and assistance and the way that they interact with our lives and the way that we as human beings relate to and value these items. And so I think we need to kind of broaden the way we are considering crafting policy to move beyond corporations versus individuals to corporations, individuals, and property as sort of a triangular relationship. Yeah, so I want to I want to be uh, I want to be time sensitive here, and there's a lot of really good questions in the chat. So um, rather than doubling back on this uh, the relational turn, I, I want to kind of take this conversation that we're talking about right now a bit further. And Ibike asks, 
Does being sensitive or conscious require being a subject of rights? So more precisely, in order to talk about a right in a technical sense, that right must be claimable. But animals, for example, cannot claim anything from people who harm them. Only the state can impose sanctions on those people for their misbehavior. At this point, aren't we talking about an obligation to persons rather than a right given to a robot or animal? So your thoughts on this? So I'll just say, hi, BK, nice to see you here. Um, BK is coming to study with me at Northern Illinois University from Turkey um, in a, a semester. So she and I have had some nice exchanges uh, over the past. Um, so it's nice to see her here and uh, have this really uh, great question. Um, I think what we're struggling against is the binary distinction that we have in both law and ethics between person and thing. This is a distinction we inherit from the Romans, especially Gaius in the in Institutes says that the law deals with two things, persons and things. And Western legal systems have inherited this distinction. And as a result, we've got to compartmentalize things. And you'll notice we made corporations persons because they didn't work as things. So the other, only other category we had was person. So we made corporations persons for better or worse. And that, does, that has nothing to do with the properties of the corporation. It isn't conscious, it isn't sentient. It has to do with what our law needs in order for something to be a subject of law. And I think what we're confronting now in the face of the AI or the faceplate of the robot is a real challenge to this binary dichotomy, this differentiation between person and thing. And the solution, as I think Divya was pointing out towards the end of her talk, is we need to develop a much more sensitive and nuanced legal ontology that allows for a broader spectrum of entities that we are able to fit into our current legal and moral systems. Person and thing may not be able to do it any longer. And a lot of our struggles, I think, are us butting up against the categories that we impose to try to make sense of these things, as opposed to asking ourselves to reinvent or at least challenge ourselves to think about how the categories uh, were derived in the first place and what they mean for the future. I'd also like to add that um... The only reason animals can't claim things from people are because of our, our current legal framework, right? And if the animals have representation in a court of law, uh, which some do at this point, they are generally represented by human beings and they can claim the right to exist, the right to um, die without pain, right? Uh, we have animal, this is the whole world of animal rights. Um, and animal rights frameworks, uh, the lawsuits have to be brought by people because at this point in a court of law, only a human being can um, represent the, the plaintiff or the defendant. But the plaintiff or the defendant doesn't necessarily have to be a person, a human person, right? So, you know, being very careful there with the language. Um, the plaintiff or the defendant can be an animal, it can be a group of animals, it can be a species, it can be a river, it can be a corporation, it can be a nation. And these are all non-human persons, right? And the spectrum of what a person is. And so most of it has to do with our legal framework. And if we wanted to change the law, we certainly could set it up so that um, animals have the right to representation in court. So if animals have the right to live, someone could go to court and say that we can no longer eat meat. And so it, it really depends, I think, again, on what we decide um, as a society to build into our um, laws and our cultural values. Yeah, so, so Pushing this point a little bit further, Thomas has a really good question in the chat. Um, and again, I'm, I'm apologize for folks that I'm skipping over, but we only have so much time. Um, and, and Thomas says, so he quotes you, Divya, saying, it's better to give something too much moral status than not enough. And then he quotes David saying, sometimes the doll is inanimate, sometimes not. Um, so the question is, how do we talk to the child who thinks they harmed slash killed their doll? Kind of going off this further this question that James was talking about earlier. And how do we process our guilt over harming things and people? Isn't this usually by realizing that we didn't actually hurt them as much as we thought or that they will recover? So how can this work when we do not attribute a capacity for suffering and recovery to the other? 
Divi, you want to go since uh, you were quoted first? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, this question of suffering is really interesting because I hear it come up quite often um, in the context of something being conscious or sentient, that suffering is another necessary condition, right? That if something doesn't have the capacity for suffering, it can't be alive, it can't be conscious. Uh, how do we know that it's not suffering? We, we again, we're using suffering in the context of biological systems of human experiences of pain and suffering. I'm very sure that James would agree that his daughter suffered from the doll's destruction. Does the doll itself suffer? I mean, in a sense, yes, right? It's been smashed. You can't put the doll back together again uh, very easily. You can probably glue it and it's gonna have scars if you're lucky. Um, does it suffer in the same way that we do? Does it have neurons that send signals to the brain saying something is wrong, change your behavior? No, but does it suffer in a different way? Perhaps, right? We don't know what it is to be the doll. We know that the doll is not uh, squishy and alive the way organic entities like us are but we don't necessarily know that the doll has no intrinsic property of suffering. And so I guess that's, so that's where I come at the, you know, too much moral status is better than erring on the side of dehumanizing, which is what we generally tend to do because of the guilt. Guilt is another form of pain. And in order to alleviate that pain, we distance ourselves from the action that caused it because that is what we are biologically um, ingrained to do. So I'll just add to this, um, you know, the big innovation in animal rights philosophy, especially with Peter Singer and Tom Regan in the 20th century was to use Bentham to shift the question from sentience and consciousness to can they suffer, right? So the question is not, can they talk? Can they reason? Can they think? But can they suffer? And so animal ethics really made suffering the uh, sort of uh, linchpin to the property decision about who has a right or a claim and who does not or what does not. Uh, but already in the latter part of the 20th century, the animal rights innovation is being challenged by a number of other innovations, uh, mainly out of environmental ethics, in which determining questions of suffering are no longer the status marker for who or what has a status as a moral subject. And the environmentalists that responded, especially the deep ecology people who were responding to the challenges that were posed by the animal rights uh, thinkers actually created um, another framework for looking at how we make these decisions that doesn't even use suffering as a criteria by which to uh, derive these kinds of outcomes. And Chris Stone's uh, landmark paper, Do Trees Have Standing, extends it in the direction of law. And I think that's really important to realize that suffering is just like, if you wanna put it this way, it's kind of the properties du jour of the late 20th century. Um, and we've kind of evolved beyond that through other innovations in not just environmental ethics, but also information ethics that uh, people like Luciano Floridi have developed in the early part of the 21st century. So that these things are always, and I, I, you know, I said something about this recently, um, ethics is often about power, about some in-group deciding what decision-making they're going to utilize to let others into the group and keep these external things out. And so there's always this play of power. Um, Birch says this very well. He says, you know, um, it's always a, a question of who has the power to decide the qualifying criteria. And so there's a politics behind this that I don't think it's often uh, examined enough. So uh, following up on this, David then asks a question too. And it's, you know, you mentioned trees, David. Uh, and David Wood in the comment asks, you know, the examples of trees and dollies are good. A driving accident that destroys a neighbor's tree may be sued for criminal damage to property. But what if the neighbor is from a community that insists trees are sacred and that any destruction of a tree is tantamount to murder? Therefore, the driver deserves to go to jail for murder. So sort of pushing this kind mm -hmm. of intuition a bit further. Yeah. I mean, why not? Um, if you live in a society that considers trees sacred, um, then yes, the driver would be liable for murder. This just comes back to, I guess, the, the legal framework and what we decide are the social values and 
the moral standing of everything around us. And if you, as you know, as David was saying, in terms of uh, certain indigenous philosophies or um, Eastern philosophies, if you do buy into everything is connected and everything has a certain degree of consciousness or a degree of, um, of spirituality, then you might build a society in which it is not only property damage to kill your neighbor's tree or to step on an ant. Um, you might not legally be allowed to fumigate your house. Right? I mean, I work in speculative um, ideas, right? That's what science fiction is. And I can see a future um, or a world in which we codify these things into law and you have an entire society of human beings that behave like the Janes and um, do their best to maintain life and non-life, but they, the entire planet, right? To say that earth has a right to exist and not be interfered with. Um, <laughs> in fact, my next novel, Meru, kind of pulls, pulls that to a very extreme where you have post-humans that have genetically engineered themselves to live in the vacuum of space so as not to hurt the planet. They let the humans still stay with um, some, some very strict guardrails, but uh, in general, that is their philosophy, right? Like if, you, if it is do the least amount of harm, where harm doesn't necessarily have to be tied to suffering. As David said, harm can be any sort of change in state, right? Looking at it from the point of just straight up physics. Um, you can't smash a rock um, knowingly as a, as a human being. If this is your moral core, then you do everything in your power to abide by those rules and you can legislate all of that. So the only reason we don't is because we don't value, we don't give the tree the same value that we give the dog. And we don't give, frankly, the dog the same value as the child. And sometimes we don't give the dog the same value as the house and the land that it sits on. So it's not even always just a linear thing in terms of life and intelligence and consciousness. Um, it has a lot to do with economics and um, political will. So one, uh, perhaps one final question for you, for you both, and then we can, and I'm sure I'm opening a can of worms here, but, um, uh, you know, Divya, you, you mentioned at the very beginning of your talk that Star Wars does a great job of portraying robots in a in a more positive light, and they're very often non-human like. Um, and so, I guess my question, getting back more specifically to robots themselves, is: Do you think then, you know, given the sort of relational approach that both of you are discussing here, do you think that we want to be building robots that are reflective of what human beings are like? Or ought we be focused on the kind of R2-D2 non-human uh, type robots? I mean, you know, what are, the, what are the issues that arise from, you know, I'm wondering, does it, does it you know, building human-like robots recreate uh, the kinds of biases that we already have towards other human beings? You know, so this broader question of, you know, how, given this relational approach, how do we want to actually build our robots? What, what is the best way for us to be able to relate to them? Does it need to be something like a dog or does it need to be something like a human if we're thinking, you know, maybe personal robots or so questions for you? I, I think Alec, the, the toothpaste is out of the tube on this one because we have both already. Um, we have the, the Sophia's that are very human-like. We have Ida, uh, who's very human-like. Oh. We, I think human nature is such that, you know, we want to um, build robots that are like ourselves, especially if we're going to have them for companionship. Um, and then we have all the other kinds of robots already too, right? We have the, the non-human looking ones. Um, we have robotic dogs, but we also have robotic vacuum cleaners. And like I said, we have household labor robots that most people don't think of their washing machine as a robot, but that's basically what it is. Um, 
So if it comes down to a question of should, like should we build robots uh, in our image? I don't know that there is a good answer to that. I think it will affect how we view the robots um, because it will you know, enhance that empathy that's inherent in uh, the way that we deal with them. But uh, I think as David was saying, you know, we, we already have emotional relationships with entirely inanimate objects. People name their cars, they, they name their ships, like it's gone all the way back to, you know, prehistory, right? Um, because that's, again, that's our biochemistry and that's the way our brains tend to work. And so I don't know that should is the right question here. I think the, the probably the better question is, are we going to treat humanoid robots differently from the non-humanoid robots? Because it will be easier to do so. Um, and that's really probably more the should question that I'd be concerned with, especially from a uh, legal and moral status. Should we give into that bias, um, the inherent bias of wanting to give them more higher moral standing because they look and talk and walk like us? Yeah. So, David, do you have thoughts on yeah, this? Yes, I'll just add, um, and to go back to something Divya said early on, um, a lot of this comes down to anthropomorphism which I see not as a bug, but as a feature. And as a feature, it needs to be managed and it needs to be managed well. And I think in design of robot, the morphology that we bring into the, the design process of these artifacts, um, a great deal can be done to manage the anthropomorphism in a way that is effective, uh, depending on how we want to integrate these things. I think one of the things we're trying to avoid is the uncanny belly effect. I think one of the responses people have had to the uh, very anthropomorphic looking robots like Sophia is that she's just creepy um, and that it unsettles people, which means that that robot would be very poor as a social companion in many cases because of the way it makes people feel uneasy. <clears throat> I think animal morphology is a little more effective because it sort of helps us scale our thinking to the situation of the object in our world. It's not quite a thing, it's not quite a person, like the dog, it's in between person and thing. And so the animal uh, frame that is often used to position these things helps us calibrate our expectations for the social interaction. And I think somebody like Kate Darling has done a great deal of work to help us understand how relationships with animals can help anticipate relationships with robots and how the management of the anthropomorphism will gain from understanding how this works and utilizing it as opposed to trying to avoid it. All right, well, I just wanted to thank you both so much for, uh, for the discussion today. It's been very illuminating and I know I've had a good time and I think the folks attending as well. I do wanna highlight before folks head out that our next talk is gonna be next week, October 26th on Wednesday, um, featuring Vikram Bhargava on social media and kids, moral panic or public health threat. So again, uh, that's at one o'clock next week. And I wanna thank both SP Divya and David Gunkel for being with us today. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks everyone. Thank you.